<laughs> Welcome to Vivo Church. We're uh, recording today a video, and that's spelled V I D D E V O, for kayak canoe. Yeah, all these words, right? <laughs> now, how do you spell that? That's a good question. You see, video, V I D D E V O, is not video, but video devotional. Vidivo. And we kind of noticed that we coined the phrase long about the same time someone else was also using the phrase. So we tried to maybe talk them out of using it or abusing it or confusing it with what we were doing because we prayed about it and God had given us vidivo.org to start a ministry. And so we changed that to vidivochurch.org. And we hung on to the video and gradually the person who had video disappeared or they quit using it. And it's no longer out there for them. And I think we registered it once, but who knows? The point being is this, you don't have to do something about something when sometimes prayer can take you there. In other words, think about that. You want to do something about it. You want to accomplish something in your timing. You want to do it your way, and you want to do it your will. But prayer, if you take it at its literal meaning, conversation with God, talking to and responding to God speaking with you, then suddenly you have a, another voice, another intelligent person contributing to the conversation that is going on in what you want to do. We call that the living God for a particular reason, because he is living. He's alive and able to communicate with those who call upon his name. Jesus himself said that, I only do the will of my Father in heaven who sent me. And the religious leaders of his day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rabbis, as you would say, pastors, they kind of knew where he was coming from because he was born in Bethlehem or in that day Judea because they didn't really know exactly which town he had come from. But they knew his family, you know, Joseph and Mary, and kind of knew that he was Jewish, you know, and that he had, you know, some heritage. But they really didn't know who his father was and used a lot of slights because there was always a question, there was always a legend about him being either a, what's called in Hebrew, a monster, a bastard, or being something more that they didn't understand. They didn't understand that there could be what some people call the Immaculate Conception, or in reality, God intervening in the affairs of man by becoming the Son of Man. Now, it had been already discussed in the Council of Rome. It had already been pretty much argued about by rabbis from previous times so that there were legends, there were stories, there were fables, there were myths. You've probably heard some of them recently if you participated in going on the internet and found things about Serabis, Seriabus or some other Egyptian god who came down and his mother was called the mother of God and he was supposed to be the son of God. And You've heard all those fables and stories. They sometimes come out at holidays where people are starting to argue about what they think you should do as opposed to what you want to do. You know, Christmas or Easter or whatever. The reality of sometimes having information is when you have too much information. Sometimes you don't know what to do with that information if you're not able to process it, if you're not able to fact check it if you're not able to find the source of where you're getting your information from. There are a lot of religions that are started that way. There are a lot of false belief systems that are started that way. There's a lot of things out there that you could get involved in just by way of the internet. That's why we call this too much internet, TMI. Now TMI used to be too much information. You know, you've been in those conversations where somebody says, hey, you know, I got hemorrhoids. Oh, wait a minute. Too much information. I don't want to know. I mean, hey, nice to know that you want to go find somebody who wants to listen, but 
may I suggest you go to a doctor for that? Because <laughs> no offense, I really don't want to think about hemorrhoids. <laughs> yeah, TMI, TMI. And you've seen that or heard that in normal conversation or abnormal conversation, as the case may be. But when it came to Jesus, he kept talking about something that provoked the religious leaders of his day, as well as those who knew the Bible and knew the Torah and the scriptures. He kept saying, my father, as though he were talking to his father, as though every day, as he said he did, he was speaking to and having conversation with his father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I, I found that interesting before I got saved. I heard about Jesus people saying that. I heard about Jesus freaks claiming to do that. I personally didn't really believe too much in it until God did it. And then I couldn't really explain it. You see, a lot of people want to say, oh, well, you know, you just study the Bible and you'll find the right answer. Or you just read the Bible and you'll get there. I got news for you. Too much information sometimes isn't going to get you where you want to go. Sometimes too much information may be giving you too much information and then you're overburdened and not able to think through what it is you just read through. I know there's a lot of people that have told me, hey, I read the Bible five or six times and I didn't get, you know, saved. And I'd say, you're right, you probably did. But you see, the difference was I took what I read and I went after it with everything it said. When Jesus claimed to talk to his father, I wanted to know his father. When Jesus said, I could know the father like he knew him, I said, I want you to prove to me you're real. I want you to demonstrate to me and show me not just by, you know, belief and faith in this words that are written in this book called the Bible, but I want you to intervene in my life. And he did. <laughs> wow. In a huge, dramatic way. And I pursued it to this day. And every day I have to make the same claim that Jesus said. Yeah, if you really want to, God will speak to you. If you really choose to, God will have conversation with you. So that's why we talk about prayer to take it there. Because you're never going to get anywhere thinking or believing in a God or some God or gods by just simply acknowledging that, oh, I have to believe it by faith without being able to see it or do it or hear it or touch it or feel it or have some kind of, you know, experience. Hey, I got news for you. You can have all of them, you know. I'm not talking about being some kind of wacko and nearly dying, you know, and come back and tell me about, you know, green pastures and horses and unicorns in heaven. But you can have now, as it were, God as real as that chair sitting across you can't see out of camera. As real as that chair is sitting in front of me, there are times where God and I, we just have conversations like that. Jesus sitting there, me, you know, really venting about what I'm really frustrated about. When I'm passionate, when I'm sincere, when I am pursuing God with all my heart, and I mean with all my soul too and strength. Because I get very serious when I'm serious about certain things in the Bible or truths that I want to know. Is this real? Or is it too much information? You see, when I first went on the internet, it was easy to know what was wrong and what was right because it was so obvious a lot of things were just stupid. I mean, you know, common sense told me, ah, that ain't real. And as I studied, I learned to process information to know the difference between what is, some people would say garbage in, garbage out, but I would say is fallacy that has maybe three parts of it true and one part wrong. And I would take the three parts true and know what they were true. But I would reject the one part and so the conclusion would be wrong. That's the sum total of what we call logic or critical thinking in logic. Processing a certain principle of a dynamic equation whereby you can tell and differentiate between supposition and provable fact. 90% of what people write on social media maybe more than that, and I'm not going to use the 99 and 1%, which is really stupid, but you know, 90% probably, or maybe less, maybe more, is supposition. People passing on mistaken information. We would say misinformation or mistaken identification of opinion 
versus factual data. And that's probably why we wanted to make this tape, and God said do it, about TMI. Because too much information is really what we want to not talk about as opposed to too much internet. Because I don't know about you, but most of the people that I have to deal with on a daily basis, and I mean Video Church, we deal on a daily basis with, oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 people regularly checking out Video and watching videos in order to learn so that they can take for themselves the information presented and go to God with it and have a conversation. You see, everything that we do in video church as well as in the video ministries is about this principle. The Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. We want you not being told but you of yourself learning, discovering, and adapting to having a personal relationship with God by way of his son, Jesus. Now, Jesus said to himself, look, you can go after God all you want to, but you're not going to get there without me. And I personally know that's a fact, because I've heard people tell me about their God. And, I, you know, if that's their God, you know, I'm, you stay out of my boat, <laughs> because what makes my boat float is Jesus. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sitting in a boat and I'm thinking about some of these statements I've heard people say about their God and I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, no offense, but you know, sounds a little rocky to me. <laughs> Whoa, you know, I'd rather stay in this boat. And it's kind of interesting is that, you know, while we're talking about this boat on a side subject, because you'll see that we do that a lot in video, talk about other things so that you can take this in pieces and use it as you choose. This is a very elegant, nice boat. You know, it's beautiful. I mean, it's got some pretty hard kind of like canvas material that's been polycryler compressed in order to be designed for a specific purpose to be an all-around functional kayak for family entertainment, family use, raided by the Coast Guard and the Indoor Water Association and all that stuff to up to Class 3 rapids. Now, the other boat you see me in my kayak canoe, <laughs> which is what I titled the series after, the yellow boat is an imitation of this one. This boat has been around about 30 years, or the company has, and they've been building this boat for a long time. They haven't made many changes. You know, the tubes in the bottom of the boat went from seven to five, and maybe the materials made out of it is a little more solid, and they make boats now for the Coast Guard. You know, they make all kinds of boats. But this is their number one seller and the number one seller in America of a popular kayak. Now you've seen all the kayaks you can buy, you know, for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or whatever, you know, in the store, the plastic, you know, kind of rollover kind of dealy. Well, this I like to call, the reason why I call the other one a kayak canoe is because this kind of kayak, this one happens to be 14 feet long, so you can't really tell the depth perception of it, but now that I have my legs extended, I could put another person up there and I still have room in the back. <laughs> yeah, that long. But, um, this particular kayak, I call it elegant because it's streamlined. It's just what you need. It's just perfect, and it's just, that's it. It'll go, and it flies across the water. And it's my wife's, <laughs> so I'm jealous. So I have to get that off my chest so that I can talk about God instead. But really, you could call this too much information as I talk about this, but I want you to process in some ways as we go through this study the idea of Jesus being in the boat with you. Because that's what happened a few times with the disciples. Jesus said, hey, check it out. Let's go across. You know, because one of the places that they call his base of operations was a place called Capernaum. Now, that's not really the way they say it in Hebrew or the way they say it in the Middle East. They would say Kafar Nahum. And Kafar Nahum is two words, not one Greek word spelled C-A-P-E-R-N-A-U-M, like you have in your Bible. It would be K with a little hyphen F-A-R, and then Nahum, or Nahum is what Nahum would be, N-A-H-U-M. That's a little kind of like Hebrew, um, Arabic, Middle Eastern word for you to learn. You know, I mean, not that you're ever going to use it, but, you know, it's kind of interesting because some things let you know that 
hey, I have some background in knowing what I'm talking about. Kafar Nahum, Capernaum. And when he was in Capernaum, that was where he based his operations from when he left Jerusalem and wasn't ministering there or out in the wilderness, like when he wandered for, when he was out there for 40 days. He went to Capernaum or visiting his family on, you know, the banks of what we call the Galil, which is the entire area, the Sea of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee or the Galilee, being called a Galilean because they were that type of people, poor fishermen that worked on the lake. That's kind of why, you know, I like starting this series and talking about the boat. When Jesus was in the boat, he kind of relaxed. He took it easy. He was a carpenter's son. He knew enough to know that, hey, Peter's the fisherman. Leave him in charge. And sure enough, there was a time where Peter was taking them across on the boat and, hey, they had no problems. Another time, Jesus sends them out in the boat and he says, I'll catch up with you. So Peter's, you know, leading the disciples, you know, in his boat, you know, going across the lake and looks over there and says, oh my God, it's Jesus. And Jesus, he says, Lord, bid me to come to you. And he jumps out of the boat and goes walking on water for a little while. <laughs> you know the story. And other times, there's even a time where the crowds are so big that Jesus says, okay, let's, let's get in the boat and just put out a little bit from the shore. And he teaches from the boat to the people on the shoreline which, if you know anything about acoustics, you know that if you're sitting on a boat in the water, your voice is going all over the shoreline. So everyone could hear what he was saying. That's kind of why we have such an accurate testimony of what he said and what he taught. The accuracy is something that's a Jewish trait because people, even in native cultures, like you know in Native American cultures, there are the storytellers, the wise men, the elders who would tell the story of their tribe. They might use a totem to do it, like in the Inu Inupic or the Inuit Indians that can tell the story of certain happenings that have gone on in their tribe. Or when they say, you know, the year of the moonrise that had no rain, or the year of the flood that, you know, whatever. And so they identified things by storytelling oral law, as you've heard that expression, or oral tradition, by talking to one another. And that leads us to the place where I want you to be. You should be having oral communication with God. I mean, seriously. You think you're hearing hear, hear, voices in your head? I got news for you. You may need to go to a doctor for voices in your head because I got voices in my ear that Jesus is speaking to me. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they will not follow the voice of another. That's the point we're trying to make about TMI when it's too much internet. Maybe the reason you can't hear, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, isn't because of reading, but really too much internet. You're trying to use your thumb to do what your brain should be doing. You know how you thumb it, you know, you can do it little swipe, you know, you can get your little Bible program up. Yeah, I mean, you know, I understand that. I'm a network engineer, retired more or less. And, you know, I uh, understand technology, but I don't use it. But, you know, except for, you know, on video, but video church, but I don't use you no know, fast devices on Bible and stuff. Kind of like the holding on to something more than, you know, although we are going to use a tablet pretty soon. Kind of went there. But I remember having a droid when I first, you know, they came out. But the point is, when you're looking at a screen, they've already proven that technology, as we might say, TTMI, too much technology, or in this case, too much focus on this little screen on your phone will get you killed if you're driving. You know that. I don't know if you realize this, but they've already done enough studies to have proven that people are overwhelmingly focused in on this little device that they have so much information that should it beat them, should it buzz them, should it speak music or should it talk, they pay attention to it and they will even do so at the risk of their own life while driving. Now some have trained themselves to not do that. Some have learned how to adapt to it, you know, maybe putting an earpiece in or, you know, a different type of, you know, projection screen on their window, windshield while they're driving, or whatever it may be. But the point of it is, is it's too much internet. 
you need to take time to get away from having to read and spending time to listen. You see, I did seek out and search for having this personal relationship I have now. It took a cost to me. I had to get away from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was wonderful. The gifts that I had that were being exercised there at Big Calvary back in the day when I was a quiet, humble, silent, behind the scenes kind of guy that was working at the Calvary Chapel Tape Lending Library with Maddie and Eileen, recording all these up and coming pastors, Greg and Mike and Josh and all, you know, people all over the place. I mean, it was Malcolm, T, and I mean, I can't even think of a Bob and yeah, I mean, there were so many people. I was like, Bleh. you know, it was like smorgasbord. I mean, I went to church seven days a week. It was wonderful. I was taking in and taking in and taking in and taking in. Kind of like why after about two years of it, Romaine finally stood up in a Thursday morning study and said, look, if you've been here two years, you've been here too long. You need to get out and do something. Well, I took that as a word from the Lord and went out and fell flat on my face. But the point is, I, I, God used it. <laughs> Forty years later, I know how important it was to get out and get going and get on with it. And that might be your problem right now. You might think, well, you know, I went to a Bible study, I got saved. You know, I, I go to church on Sunday, you know, I sit in a pew, I, I feel good when I worship, you know. And the pastor, you know, he's teaching through the Bible, so I'm, I'm getting something, you know, out of it. You know, I might ask you, well, what are you getting out of it? Do you remember it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Because if you don't, I question how much you're learning and how much you're just overloading your sensory perception, spiritual sensory perception. Because TMI, as we're talking about this first one, there'll be another one that'll be about something else, TMI. But too much internet can dull the senses. One of the things I discovered very early on when I was still on Usenet days, early internet, before we have the internet we have now today, it used to be bulletin boards and kind of like and more typing than anything else. We had chat rooms before they had text. And, you know, you'd have like 60 conversations going, you know, be tapping away. You know. But... In those days, you had to pay very much focused attention to the words you used and what you said. It was important because you could not communicate an idea because otherwise it would be misread or misinterpreted. And that's what's happened in the internet today. The internet today on social media has everyone interpreting what everyone else is saying. And unless you want to spend the next 20 minutes trying to explain what you wrote, they don't get it. I particularly am one of those types of people who has a volume of material all over the internet. I have blogs, I have bulletin boards, I have um, WordPress sites, I mean websites and social media and you name it, you know. At one time flooded, it used to be about a thousand. I think the, the highest volume that we had a few years back before gave away part of the ministry to a young man that's back east, um, is almost 10,000 per day. And that's a lot of people that are participating and evaluating and dealing with information that you're presenting to them. It's a pretty powerful ministry when you have 10,000 a day and you're doing it seven days a week. And I think we hit 100,000 that month or 300,000, I don't even know, but I, at the time it was interesting. It burned me out, but you know, it was like, wow, that's all I did. But uh, joyful time, interesting time, wonderful time. But I learned also that people were not getting the message. So I began to say, look, why don't you watch one of my videos to see who I am, then read what I'm saying. Because what I used to say and what I still say in comments and stuff is misread oftentimes as being, well, you're really mad. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you you're wrong. <laughs> That's all. I mean. I'm sorry, but you know, you don't have the information databases I do. I can run five browsers at one time, you know, and I got tired of saying it so that I don't do it anymore. Because then I was accused of pride. I mean, it's like, dude, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, look, this is what I do normally. This is my ministerial life. So rather than, you know, have to go through this every time that, you know, thousands of people, I finally just said, forget it, you know. And then 
as time wore on, people began to read them a little differently. And they said, you know, that doesn't sound quite bad, as it does sound like information. And so I began to process that with people and tell them that there's a possibility you may be overloaded with too much data that you can't compute. And we do that, or I should say we, hackers do that now when they call it a, a end of service or point of service attack where they constantly bombard a server with too much information. It's always, you know, like 3,000 logins in a nanosecond. Overwhelms the server. They can't do it so the computer can't figure out all the commands to do so it crashes. Maybe you in your day today are crashing and burning and don't even know it because you're addicted to TMI. You're addicted to information and internet. You're so caught up in the fascination of social media, you're being wiped clean of the perspective of peace and having love and enjoying life that all you're really doing is becoming bitter and antagonistic, protagonistic, even an advocate for maybe things that aren't that important. Really, seriously. I mean, no offense, but if I was living in Timbuktu and Timbuktu had only two people in it, and I heard about, you know, the Syrian refugee crisis, I might pray and be thankful to pray, but I wouldn't get all involved and wrapped up in it. You know what I mean? I mean, there's only so much you can do, and a whole lot you can't do. But one thing you should do, and that's going to lead us into reading the devotional, is that you should pray. You should not be so caught up in your too much information, too much internet, that you don't step back, put away the sound system you have, take the earbuds out, you know, go somewhere alone. Normally they say in your prayer closet, but after the war room, not quite sure what people are going to get out of that, but okay, you know. I mean, it's a wonderful movie, but, you know, I kind of think it's a little one side out on one side, and it's pretty good because it's going to make people at least head in the right direction, but, you know, whatever your prayer closet is, as Jesus talked about, but Jesus mentions something that he did every day, and you may not be in the place to go to a prayer closet like the war room, but you can do this every day. Come away with me, my love to a place beyond all reasoning. Partake within your heart of my perfect peace. I desire for you to know me in a way you've yet to taste of. Let me pour myself upon you, enter in. That was written by a wonderful woman of God who's a pastor's wife. And I'm not going to say her name, Julie Langfield. Oh, sorry, I said her name. But, you know, she's had to deal with an interesting character, a pastor, her husband. <laughs> you know, when it comes to Flaky, I'm called that a lot, you know, because I'm a Jesus gypsy. But when it comes to pastoring and worship, well, worship leader, he's wonderful. Pastoring, that guy's flaky. I mean, I got news for you. you know, it doesn't take very long to figure that one out. And there have been a lot of, you know, people that love him to death, you know, got saved by him. But, you know, when it comes to, like, really on, spot on, on the word, be careful. <laughs> a little flaky there, you know. Frosted flakes, yes, but, you know, a little flaky. So be careful how much milk you pour on. It might get soggy after a while. But, uh, you know, I've seen him from the beginning and seen him at the end. You know, and he's still going. You know. <laughs> he is what he is. So, in that song that she sang, it really ministers to me in the sense of, you've got to get away, like Jesus did. Before it was even sunrise, he didn't just open up a Bible and say, oh, I think I'll pray. Or sit down and say, let me examine the Torah and pull out the scrolls. No, they only did that maybe once a week on Shabbat. The rest of the time, they talked about it. They walked about it. They meditated on it. They thought on it. They considered it. They talked to each other about it. They spent probably a good mile or two walking and talking and considering it and arguing about it for days, not weeks, but days. And that was the responsibility of a hearer to do. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You're not supposed to just take it in. You're supposed to be able to regurgitate it in what you understand it to be. Jesus used that principle in this way. He said, 
Who do men say that I am? Now that's a typical after church question. That's a typical discipleship material type statement that would have been done in Jewish culture as being, hey, you guys are living with me. I'm talking to you around the campfire. This is something we're going to have a discussion on. So let's open up the doors and say, you got an opinion, tell me. And they would say, you know, well, who do who do you say that, you know, what do, what do people say that, and, you know, they're like mouthing off, you know, well, some say you're Elijah, well, some say, because they had the freedom to speak. Interesting, isn't it? In a teaching, freedom to speak. Jesus is having a conversation. This is his teaching ministry. Conversation, not preaching one-sided like I'm doing right now or like your pastor does on Sunday. Let's be real. He does. He preaches. He doesn't teach. Teaching might have been called Sunday school to some, but hey, what they call teaching now, that ain't teaching. That's preaching. And it's a one-sided, let me tell you what I've learned. And God hopes that, you know, the Holy Spirit will make it applicable to you. And so they try to use expositional analogy of some type of claiming it's expository to give you at least something to take for thought and in some ways God honors him and makes it work for you. For a lot of other people, it doesn't work so well. Because, <laughs> you know, if the Holy Spirit got to, if I got a question, I want to raise my hand and talk. You know, I want to, you know, let's get real about it. Well, you save those questions till after the service. Well, I did and talked to Chuck once, and Chuck told me I was right. And I went, okay, well, <laughs> what do I do now? I'm like, ah, you know, I was lost. <laughs> Last thing I expected. I had everything all laid out, you know, about giving you know, the temple and stuff being rebuilt. But Chuck just goes, yeah, it's pretty good. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> I expected him to debate it, you know, or something, or talk. But, or tell me I'm wrong, which I was kind of hoping, but he left me out in the gray matter area of talking to God and working with him. And that's where you should be. You shouldn't be a sheep. Now, I don't mean sheeple, because that's a derogatory term. I mean, really, you're supposed to grow up into the man of God or the woman of God you're supposed to be. You're going to, most of you are going to have children, and you're going to have to teach them. A father should be teaching his son and daughter and his wife, even, of the things that he's learned. And they, by hearing your teaching, should be responding to you of what they've learned in the experience of life. That's what Jesus did when he talked to his disciples. He said, "Who do what do people say I am? And then he brings it home. The, the rubber meets the road when he finally says, Who do you say that I am? Oops, we didn't see that coming. Man, as long as we're talking about somebody else, it's okay. But when we talk about ourselves, are we willing to own up to what we say? Are we willing to own up to what we do? Let me tell you in TMI, too much internet, you aren't. I know, I confront you. I'm the guy that says false all over the internet. Because not only did you not check the source, you didn't check the facts. Snopes isn't the only place to check for information, whether it's a scam, a lie, a fallacy, an untruth, or a political ad, like you're running into this season, you're gonna see a lot of them. But you didn't even bother to use your own noggin. You know, I write sometimes stupid because frankly, anyone that would believe that has to be stupid because you wouldn't believe it if you were thinking. You were using stinking thinking, as Romaine used to say. You didn't bother to think. That's why it stinks. It putrefied in your head, whatever it was that you had there. You should be using at least some of your own personal knowledge, personal application of that knowledge, which is what the Bible calls wisdom, your experience level of how you've applied it in your life, which is that type of sagely wisdom that comes with age and becoming more of a man of God than, you know, somebody that's misled and, quite frankly, ready to be dead in their sins and go to hell instead. Because God doesn't leave you in a pew to stink. I mean, think of the word pew. No! I mean, really, maybe it's time that you got up on the stage you know, and was the teacher. Now, your own stage may be a little smaller than the one you see in front of you, but hey, you should be teaching someone somewhere at some time. Or you should be talking to God someplace. I personally, every day, have conversation with Jesus. 
by way of his spirit, he always applies to me what he's saying, oftentimes audibly, many times emotionally, a lot of times circumstantially, sometimes physically, and very few times through the Word. I mean, because, you know, I know the Word, so it's like it would be too easy to take it out of context, but there are times where it just fits. It just comes together, and it just, like, stands out like, like now. <laughs> wow, you didn't see that coming, did you? Of course you did. Come on, use some common sense. But in TMI, we're at this place where we say, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. I know that you can do everything. That's a scripture, believe it or not. That's Job 42.2. It says, the things which are impossible with man are possible with God. Let's put that into perspective for a minute. You just heard that. You know, and you probably applied it to, well, you know, that just means, you know, like if you want to go witness to somebody, you know, you know, blah, 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 they send a missionary. Or that just means, you know, like miraculous healing like you see on TV or some kind of speaking in tongues. No, it's like the two people in Timbuktu who decide that, hey, you know what, I want to see what God can do. Let's the two of us go and help those refugees. Now, Timbuktu may be left behind, but guess what? God sent them, if that's what God told them. You see, the things that are impossible with man are possible with God because God is searching the whole world over for someone whose heart is perfect towards him, or, as it really says, whose heart is seeking after him. Like David, a man seeking after God's own heart. Not a man after God's own heart, but seeking after God's own heart. David's heart was not like God. I'm sorry. <laughs> there isn't much about David's heart that I see really like God. But he was seeking God because he was always in love with God. He was always, when God confronted him in his sin, admitted it. Yeah, I blew it, but I don't want to lose you. So God says, well, you know, you're going to lose some people. And, you know, the people die because of it. His sin. But David, as well as the proverb, as well as you, are the one who gets to make the choice of what you will do when God says something like, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You can't get to God, but the interesting thing is God can get to you. You see, that's why I can tell you that sitting in that chair is the Spirit of God right now. He not only enlightens me, He invigorates me, He quickens me to be able to speak to Him and ask Him to reveal to you the truth, to take that which is dross or that which isn't good for you and to call it too much information, call it too much internet since you're probably watching this on the internet, and to just say, put away those things that don't help them. But Lord, you, by way of your administration, can make them have ears to hear what it is the Spirit of God says. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. So you see, the faith come by hearing isn't just listening, it's having someone whispering in your ear. God himself said in Deuteronomy that I will be their God and they will be my people and I will whisper in their ear to turn to the right or the left, to go forward or to go back, to stand still or to move forward. And in reality, that is what God did with them. And they were shocked that the living God, the God of the mountain, could be the God of the people. And when Jesus came, he shocked them completely. They were amazed that, wait a minute, you know, that's not our God. Our God is over in the temple. He only does, you know, like tears curtains, you know, and does little signs and wonders, you know, when the high priest tells us, you know, like the made up idea of Hanukkah and all that kind of false stuff that they were playing with because of the Maccabean revolt and the pollution they thought of Hellenism, whoa, coming into Judaism, whoa, and making it not what they wanted it to be at that time. So the Hasmonean dynasty of priesthood took over and about that time is when Jesus comes on the scene and says, uh-uh, you don't even know who your father is. Ouch! Imagine a priesthood that doesn't know their father, that doesn't know who, what, or where they're going, or how they're serving, or what they're being. Jesus literally put the Pharisee in his place in the Sadducee and the 32 other parties that were involved in Israel at the time. They did not have a personal relationship with God. That's where you may be. You may be someone going along just fine, 
I mean, don't get me wrong. God's going to let you go along, you know, with your own boat. You know, you might even get an oar, you know, like this. And you might take the oars, you know, and be paddling your own canoe or stroking or paddling your own boat or, in this case, kayaking down some white water or in some flat water just cruising. Or you may be on a Christian cruise. Hey, we got enough money. We can do it. We're going to have all the worship leaders meet, you know, and all the worship people get on a luxury liner to go have some luxury QT time in being spoiled rotten on a cruise ship. Now, me being one of the guards that stood at the port, letting people come into the cruise line and get off the cruise ship, I got news for you. Sometimes Christians aren't what you think they are. Be careful. Jesus himself said to be the servant of all, you would be the greatest. But if you want to be the greatest, you must be the servant of all. I don't look at mega ministries for servanthood. I look at mega ministries as they should get their butt together and get out where there should be some place that they could go where people are so poor that they can't afford you and now you can afford them and go there. Frankly, you know, I, I'm a little frustrated over Harvest Crusades that keeps evangelizing the evangel, you know, preaching to the choir, constantly putting on the normal crusade down there in August, you know, rather than going to the poor people. Take your crusade, grab all the people that are in it, and just get up, walk out, and go out on the streets. Now, that would be a shock. God bless Bob Langfield, who did that one time in a church service, said, come on, let's go. And he was like, I was, I fell in love with the man at that moment. He got up from behind the pulpit with his guitar, went outside, the church followed behind him, we went around the corner, and we witnessed to a bar, you know, having an outdoor service. That was weird, but, you know, I may be a little evangelical or Pentecostal, but hey, he came from John Corson's church. In his early days, he's a pretty interesting character, but he was dealing with the interesting time in Klamath Falls, Oregon. There was a lot of demonic activity. I mean, genuine demonic activity, not the kind of phony stuff you hear about on the Internet. When God wants to do something, he doesn't need your permission. When God chooses to use someone, he doesn't ask you for his, your will. He just simply says, follow me. And if you do, you're blessed. If you don't, you won't. I got news for you. If you want to hear from God, you have to obey. That's just it. I mean, there's there's no question about it. I don't mean obey the Ten Commandments. I don't mean obey um, reading your Bible every day or praying every day or anything like that. I just mean when you get God that decides to suddenly talk to you, whatever he says, do. I was confronted that way, and I about choked on my own, you know, gulping because God asked me to do something that required of me a statement of faith. And I kind of gulped him and he says, when God spoke to me, he said, this is Jesus. And I said, nothing. And I knew that I was in trouble because I felt no presence of God inside me. I felt kind of empty. I felt like kind of like, just, I don't even know. I. It's amazing. It's amazing. As a writer, I should be able to say what it is. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's a vacuum of what I would have said. The spiritual reality was that in the dimension of the spirit, that when you're with Jesus, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. You're not. So let's be real. Until the flesh puts on incorruption, you're not full of the Holy Spirit. Your spirit, you know, you got to measure of faith and measure of the spirit. You know, a, a certain amount of down, down deposit. You aren't overflowing like Jesus is. So when Jesus spoke to me and said, you know, this is Jesus, the next statement was, do you believe me? And man, I about came unglued. I mean, it just felt like kaboom. All my searching, all my wondering, all my realities, everything that I had questioned, everything that I had argued about, everything that I doubted, all came to the surface and focused in on that one question. Do you believe me? And I went, Yes, Lord. Well, I didn't say Lord. <laughs> yes, it was hard. I, back of my mind, fully expected that it was a con or some kind of phony thing or some spirit or some angel of light or, you know, all the different things. If you're a mature Christian, you would know to, you know, doubt about. <laughs> you know, really. No. Nothing happened. Then. Just Jesus spoke to me. And he spoke to me calmly, rationally, normally. 
And he said right after that, there is a place for you in my kingdom. Now I know after that he said some things. I don't know what they were. Because I had been arguing about the kingdom. And I had been arguing about my place in the kingdom because I was such a humble, terrified, lonely, scared, baby Christian behind the scenes. You know, full of gifts that were, you know, people were like incredibly shocked by words of knowledge, words of wisdom, laying on of hands, all kinds of things I was doing. I was just, didn't know I was doing them. I just kind of, oh, really? That's what that is? I didn't know that. Somebody'd say, well, I got a headache. So let's pray. You know, and I'd pray with them and they get healed. And I was like, huh, how are we doing? That's cool. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I said, you know, God did it. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you sit down and you go, oh, I got this. Like nowadays, in those days, it was like everybody was doing it. I thought. Now, some of the old timers tell me, uh-uh, we weren't doing that. And I'm going, really? <laughs> Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I was so scared. So scared. <laughs> Can I repeat that? So scared. I mean, you know, kind of those things. So, really, I understand you. You know, you want to be on the internet. You want to have too much internet, and you want to have too much information. You want to make it safe for you to be able to not have to deal with the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And that scripture meant the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It meant the Father of Jesus. It meant the one you know as the omnipotent, almighty reigns, or you know, our Father or in heaven, or however you have interpreted the being that when God spoke to Moses simply said, I don't have a name, and you're going to make one up, I know, and it's going to mess you up, but anyways, I am that I am. And he just simply meant, I'm, I, I exist. That's it. God exists. The Father exists. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but He exists. And you're never going to understand that. Ever. Never. You won't. You can't. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. My understanding is so far beyond yours. I mean, it's like, how would you creation understand a creator? Sure, God could create in you an understanding, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 simply says, Trust in the Lord. Don't worry about your understanding. In all your ways, you're not going to direct your path. How simple does that get? He doesn't want you to understand. You might not be able to handle the information. It may be too much information. And part of the problem of if you're not hearing from God, and you're not talking to God, and you're not participating with His conversation, and you haven't gone alone somewhere like in a wilderness experience or maybe quiet time, maybe someplace alone, away from the distractions, television, internet, cell phone, you know, smartphone, whatever, <laughs> however, whenever. And you haven't really just simply went out, you know, and, okay, God, I'm either going to close my eyes and you prove it, or I'm going to keep my eyes open and you prove it. Show me or talk to me or do something to prove to me. God didn't just sit down and say, hey, I got a thousand cattle on a thousand hills, prove me now here with him. You know, if you'll go ahead and invest $10, I'll give you a thousand dollars. That's not what God meant ever in that scripture. But there's something else that is true. You're not tempting God by asking him to reveal himself to you or to reveal his son to you. You are actually being smart in a way that you go beyond your understanding and blow your mind. Sure. As a deer that dying of thirst, you might have to pursue it quite a bit. You might have to go after it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You might have to want it more than you want your wife and kids and dogs and cats and you know rats and dare I say this beautiful, sleek, oh wonderful kayak. <laughs> I said it's see, I covet. But hey, you know, at least I could say, yeah, but I would sacrifice it on the altar of knowing Jesus. But the point is yeah, you might have to give up all that for a moment in time, you know, till God says, you know, you can have it, like this. He told us we could have it. It's used, you know, you can't tell that. It's used, you know, and it's cheap. But, boy, it's, it's elegant. Elegant. It's an elegant boat. And I like being in the boat. 
I like paddling in the boat, but I make sure Jesus is in the boat with me. Because God knows the storms of life are coming. And I know I'm going to hit some white water. I need Jesus every day telling me which way to go. Because I've gone down the Green River, and I nearly killed myself trying to go my own way. I looked at those rapids, and sure enough, I went through them, and I was making it. And then all of a sudden, around the bend, and there was the biggest boulder I had ever seen. There was the biggest rock nobody had ever warned me about. There was the biggest thing that the entire river was smashing into the side of. And I got smashed into the side of the rock. Boom! There is a rock that doesn't move. The rock that Jesus is called, and I'm a stone, you know, and then stone, Michael Stone, Michael Jane Stone. But, hey, you know, it sucked me under. My life preserver was on, you know, just like God said, you know, maybe your Bible is good for you and you got it in your pocket. But that life preserver didn't save me. It was a hole in whitewater kayaking, they tell you, sucks you under. It was a, whatever you call them, you know, and it was pulling me under. Funny thing was, was because I've been a Christian a long time, I wasn't thinking about dying, even though I was underwater. I wasn't thinking about um, pain or suffering or, you know, like, what's, what are my kids going to say? Your kids, what are my wife going to say? What are um, her kids going to say? What's going to happen or anything like that? I was just mad. <laughs> I was mad I hit the rock. <laughs> I was mad that the kayak tipped over. I wasn't caring about anything else. And I used my legs and I kicked against the rock and popped out of the force of the water, forcing me under the rock and keeping me underwater with the life preserver on. And I came out over, you know, and was was uh, to the side of it and got out of that, you know. I want Jesus in the boat so he'll tell me which way to go next time. You know, Michael, I want to learn you I want you to learn this lesson. Next time pray a little more about Green River. You weren't ready. And maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're not ready to talk to God about everything in your life. Maybe you have some Issues that you're hiding, your sins, you know. God knows I had plenty of sins when I came to Jesus, and I've been working on them for 40 years. I'm not over all my sins. Not a chance. And maybe too much information for you or TMI for the Internet. Maybe too much Internet for you is maybe porno, or maybe it's, you know, um, anger or vice. Maybe you're playing gambling on the Internet, or you're doing some kind of business deal, or whatever you're doing on the Internet. Maybe too much of that is what's affecting your relationship with God. Maybe you could have a better one if you just, you know, kind of cut back a little. You know, I'm not going to tell you you're going to quit sinning because, you know, until God does it, you won't. You'll try, but you'll fail. I mean, that's, the, that's obvious. Your body wants what it wants when it wants it. You know, and if your spirit isn't strong enough to say no, I don't care how much self-discipline you got or how much you got friends around, it ain't going to work. Just like a friend of mine recently, you know, an alcoholic, went back to be an alcoholic and died. What can I say? You know, he quit for a while, but he couldn't give it up. Or like um, one of the greatest Jesus freaks I know, Lonnie Frisbee. He was gay. Before he was working with Calvary Chapel at Costa Mesa, getting it started and helping to start the Jesus movement, he was gay. He had problems with dealing with homosexuality in Orange County. He did not, according to his own testimony and witness, continue that lifestyle once he started participating with and being a part of, with Chuck Smith and with other people in the Jesus movement. During that time of first love, falling in love with Jesus, he was completely committed to that and then later fell and went back to that gay lifestyle was never able to give it up to the end of his life. But he still was a Christian, he still witnessed, he still talked, he still warned people, he still told people. You tell me about what you think can't be saved, and I'll tell you, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I know, because I watched these people through the years grow up, or die, in some ways, in their sin. So you can tell me, you know, like on the internet, when you get too much information, gay Christians can't be saved. I'm going to say, they can be saved. They may not be able to save themselves from their own sin, just like you probably can't give up something you're doing. Your anger or your wrath or your hatred of the political system or the president or Republicans or Democrats or you can't give up your gun, of all things. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. But, you know, maybe you're a gun lover and you can't give it up. You know, you're just so lustful for violence. Maybe you can't quit being violent. Maybe you're a white beater or child beater or, you know, one of those uh, child molesters that they say never recover. You know, I mean, personally, I do know child molesters can recover. 
No, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I don't child molest. Sorry, I fell in love with Jesus. But, um, hey, you know, I know some people that are into that, that have been saved by God, and that they talk about they have issues, and that they don't trust themselves alone with children. So they remove themselves from that situation, and they maintain a integrity with another brother or sister that keeps them safe because they are Christians, but they still have a problem. Because until we all enter into heaven, we're going to deal with this problem of sin. We're going to deal with this internet that's sometimes a blessing when you have it in the right balance and sometimes becomes too much internet because you have too much information. And dare I say it to you bluntly, not enough wisdom to know what to do with it. Because if you don't have someone to talk to, if you don't have someone to walk with, if you don't have a companion or a friend, if you don't have, as it were, what we say in the Jesus movement, a personal relationship with Jesus, you're fooling yourself. You got religion. You got a church. You got a good feeling. And you know what? We hippies knew what a good feeling was. We'd already been there and tried it all. We had done every little thing you could imagine all under the sun, and now people are doing it again in the millennial generation, just shocking me. But we tried it all, and nothing worked. Oh, you could get by for a while. But then when those who had a personal relationship with Jesus discovered that, they gave up everything for that. Not that as a religion to become a Calvary Chapel or a vineyard or a born-again Catholic or born-again Christian or born-again Baptist or born-again whatever. No. That personal, intimate, one-on-one, -on -one, knowing full well that any time they wanted to, they could talk to Jesus about it and he would answer them. That I can't deny and that I can't give up. I love it. Whenever I am in despair, yeah, God is there. Whenever I am hopeless and helpless, God is there. Have I suffered? more than you would ever dream of. I have Crohn's disease. I'm a disabled person. I have my guts cut out. You know, I wear a bag on my side. I'm just now recovering from what they call a, we couldn't tell whether it was a rotator cup, you know, injury because both arms were painful. Um, couldn't tell if it was a bicep tendonitis. But as it turns out, it's Crohn's disease causing a arthritic inflammation and deterioration of my shoulder with um, obstructive obstruction obstruction an obstruction in the whatever that is I forget what they call it now with all that osteo descriptive terminology but that's painful I mean it floored me in pain did I cry out to God yeah, God helped me, and then I went and got payment. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. The doctor, you know, I went to emergency room, and the doctor took care of it. You know, at first, gave me a shot and said, now, can we talk? I said, I think so. Can you wait a minute more? Because <laughs> you know? I was crying. And I experienced a lot of pain, and that was severe enough to put me to tears. And I couldn't breathe. I couldn't function. I couldn't think. My wife has seen something similar to that with Crohn's disease. So now we're recovering and working on it. I got a shot of, I went to the orthopedic doctor and he's working on it and trying to figure out what it is. You know, got a shot of that, whatever they stick in there and also a shot of a cortisone in there. Hey, you know, it's not, I'm moving it. I mean, there's a big deal, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna move this one that way much. But, you know, we're working on it for the next four weeks and see how that works out. They may work on the left. If it doesn't, we'll do surgery. But God doesn't say that he's going to heal you every time. God doesn't say that he's going to, you know, punish you. God doesn't say that suffering is meant to destroy you. But rather, Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. You see, the Father had already told him what to do. But Jesus still had to suffer in order to demonstrate his obedience. Sometimes, some suffering is brought on by ourselves. We do it to ourselves. And then we blame God, or blame the devil, or blame whatever. <clears throat> I don't. <coughs> I just go, Lord, what do you want to do with this? And God tells me. 
in this case, I said, you know, heal me if you can. If not, then, you know, if you want to teach me, tell me. You know, if you want me to learn from it, show me. And then if not, then tell me where to go and what to do with it. And so I go through my process of talking to him first and moving through each step. But in each step that I take, I pray. I talk to God about it. I go with what he tells me to do. You should do the same. Otherwise, no offense, what you're posting, what you're saying, what you're doing, is too much information and I really don't want to know. Because, frankly, you're just him sinning. But once you have talked it over with God, once you have spoken to Jesus about it, once you have taken the time to get your act together with you and him alone and no one else knows, then you have something viable, important, and very much informational to tell someone else. And that's why we make these videos. That's why we have Video Church. Because what we have seen, what we have heard, and what we have handled with our own hands, that is real life, that we're going to talk to you about. You want to get in the boat? Great, come on down. I mean, let's go out in the water, you know, and talk. But don't tell me about football and baseball and cars and dogs and cats and rats and elephants and whatever else you see on the internet. Because that's just too much internet. But when you have something to say about Jesus, you got my attention because I'm all yours.